Okay, thank you so much, Jack. Really, really, really nice to be here. And, and thank you so much for the invite. And it's great to be on this amazing master's program. I mean, what a wonderful concept to have a, a master's in, in, in spirituality and ecology, which is, which is so great. What's this uh, particular module, by the way? Ecology and spirituality. Oh, great. <laughs> the core module. <laughs> Fantastic. It is module. That is yep. wonderful. Okay, so uh, if you permit me, I'm going to just uh, share my screen. Uh, share the screen that um, can you see that? It should be visible now. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I mean, just, just I can completely concur with everything Jack said there, and, and, and he gave a really brilliant overview and, and, and kind of looked at it from a variety of different fields. And I like the way he's kind of brought all that together and said, you know, it doesn't matter what field of the academy you're coming from, be it ecology or parapsychology or anthropology or whatever it might be, you end up with this, again, this sense that there is this kind of inter interconnected kind of ecological entity, you know, which we might call Gaia or whatever it is. And, and that's really quite a nice way of doing it. I'm, I'm going to kind of do that in the inverse, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, and I'm going to use that by taking the example of psychedelic experiences, which I've been primarily researching for the past couple of decades. Uh, so looking at the relationship between nature and consciousness via shamanic ecodelia or ecological psychedelia, if you like. Um, so, you know, my interest in this is, has been ongoing for quite a, a, a few years. Uh, back in about 2008, I started running a, a salon at the Institute for Ecotechnics in London, uh, hosted by the October Gallery, um, called Ecology, Cosmos, and Consciousness. So trying to fuse all those kind of different notions together. I mean, that covers pretty much everything in a way. <laughs> um, but the idea that you know, notions about cosmology and existence and even the kind of phys physics sense of cosmology, but also in the methodological sense, and consciousness and the environment, ecological issues, should all be kind of thought of kind of collectively. Uh, interestingly, the Institute of Ecotechnics had a, a long history in, in kind of ecological research, and they set up this Biosphere 2 project in, in the States uh, a few decades ago, which became the subject of a controversial documentary recently. Uh, and my own particular interest in, has been in the study of altered states, transpersonal, exceptional human experiences, parapsychological, paranormal phenomena. Uh, and through a variety of other states, but primarily through the lens of uh, psychedelics. Um, so I've been studying that for about 20 years. And um, there really wasn't very much written about the overlap between psychedelics and uh, ecological consciousness. I mean, obviously there was, a, there was lots in the, in the literature in, in, kind of in, in pieces, but none of it, you know, systematically looking at this kind of overlap, but it is, it is a kind of well-known trope from perhaps the beginnings of the ecological movement that you know psychedelics have, have, have fed into that. And people like Arnie Ness, who was uh, the founder of Radical Ecology, was inspired by his own LSD experiences and, and so on. We can trace it back to that sort of shamanic origins of psychedelics as well. But uh, there wasn't really much kind of concerted systematic work in that direction until there was a special issue uh, in the bulletin of the, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. <laughs> Otherwise known as MAPS, brought out a special issue on psychedelics and ecology in uh, 2009, I think, 2008, which I contributed to with an article with uh, Stan Krippner. And then I later, that kind of evolved into a special issue for the European Journal of Eco Psychology uh, around the psychedelic experience, uh, which I guest edited. Um, and uh, some other points of interest in, we've been running, I'm here at Greenwich University at the minute, so it's kind of a dull little meeting room, unfortunately. And uh, I've been here for about 12 years, and we've been running a, a, a Europe's biggest psychedelic research conference here for the last 10 years uh, called Breaking Convention, um, uh, which now regularly attracts about 1,500 people every year, researchers from all over the world. And, you know, the psychedelic research is, is having this renaissance, this explosion of interest. You know, in the last year alone, there was about $2 billion invested into uh, the development of psychedelics as, as kind of treatments for mental health conditions like depression, anxiety, um, 
addiction, post-traumatic stress disorder, and end of life existential fear. Um, and so we've been increasingly focusing on um, psychedelics in our research and in our conference. But it's, for me, as much as anything, it's, it's a way of kind of uh, sneaking in magic through the back door of the academy. Because once you kind of lift the lid on the psychedelic experience, be you a neuroscientist or a shaman, you can't help but embrace the kind of extraordinary, exceptional experiences that ensue within that particularly, particular genius bottle. Um, so anyway, we put on this conference. It's coming back again next year. Probably look a bit like that, maybe in the future, not too far distant future. Um, but at the last conference, we did a, a special symposium on psychedelics, eco-consciousness and ecological crisis. And uh, all of our video lectures, including some from Jack over the years, are available free on YouTube and the YouTube Facebook Convention, there's over 500. But the ones from that special symposium uh, are worth having a look at. Um, Jay Griffiths, the author, Bruce Parry, the explorer and filmmaker, Sam Gandhi, an ecologist, and Gail Bradford, interestingly, the, the founder of Extinction Rebellion, Shortly after Extinction Rebellion was formed, she came to our conference and talked about how her psychedelic experiences had helped her formulate the, the, the structure of Extinction Rebellion itself. Uh, so, you know, when my colleagues tell me, well, you know, well, so what if psychedelics turn people into tree hugging hippies? What, what's that going to change? Right? And a bit, bit of a bit stimulated girl, Bradford, causes, create this massive global movement, which is probably having some real political impact um, uh, and also some commuter impact as well, then it, it, you, know, you can see how ripple effects can have knock-on big effects. Anyway, so you, I guess you could situate, you know, eco-psychology, I don't know how much you've spoken about eco-psychology, but it falls in the natural kind of fusion of the Venn diagram between psychology and ecology. Uh, but also in that you might find environmental psychology, which is really the study of you know, humans in the built environment and the kind of psychological factors around that, like, you know, lighting on, on the kind of uh, uh, built up urban environments and their effects on people's social interactions and boring stuff like that. But, you know, eco psychology is, is more about man's relationship to, to nature. Um, and it, it's probably been cultured as a as kind of therapeutic kind of dimension. Uh, it's relatively recent. So, you know, you probably thank Theodore Rodzak for instigating this, this kind of particular subfield through the publication of The Voice of the Earth and the, and the eco psychology in the early 90s. Um, but as a discipline or sub discipline, or sub sub discipline, it's directed at showing humans ways of healing alienation. And that alienation is, is seen to be an alienation from ourselves and from nature, because we are nature and we are alienated ourselves by being alienated from nature and that urbanization is the cause of, of a lot of our malady and um, we see the rise of mental health conditions particularly in the recent pandemic you know um, depression and anxiety uh, also schizophrenia things like that are, are very much much more prevalent in urban environments um, and increasingly so they're increasingly prevalent so it's become more and more technologized and automated and further away from, from uh, what we've evolved to be like through the last couple of million years as hunter-gatherers and so on. Um, and uh, we've just passed the tipping point two or three years ago where there's more people living in urban environments than there are living in outside of urban environments. Right? The majority of humans, 7 billion humans on the planet, most of them live in urban environments. Situations only going to get worse. And so somewhere perhaps rooted in there in the fusion between ecology and psychology, part of the study of shamanism might also occur. And I'm going to demonstrate that because I think shamanism is, is a kind of perfect fusion of, of psychology and ecology in many respects. Um, it's also studied by anthropologists and other researchers, but you know, in this particular Venn diagram. And so shamans are indigenous people who we find all over the world and it seems to be an ancient practice, we can infer from archaeology and historical records and so on, that it's probably been around for thousands of years. Uh, we find it on every continent of the planet, even today. And shamans are people who go into an altered state of consciousness at will in the name of their community to transcend time and space and communicate with the spirits of nature and bring back useful information for their community. Um, 
and so uh, Stan Krippner says that, you know, shamanism is a nature-based epistemology, that the very way by which they come to know the world is rooted within the natural environment, uh, one of the names. Uh, and uh, so one of the many functions of, of shamanism maybe include psychic diagnosis, healing, psychopompic activity, communication with spirits of nature, spirits of the dead sometimes, divination, precognition, location of lost objects, clairvoyance, etc. So very much in the realm of the paranormal. Um, and I've been working for the last 10 years with an indigenous tribe from Mexico called the Boradica, uh, known by outsiders as the Richolis, but that's the Spanish name was given to them. Uh, and you can see in their practices that they make use of this psychoactive cactus, peyote, which contains mescaline, uh, and that's very much at the core of their cultural identity and their cosmology. You know, their entire kind of calendar is, is based around the use of peyote, about half of the peyote, about bringing the peyote back to their community. Uh, all of their cosmology is, is kind of rooted in the, the notion of peyote and uh, having to sex, their deities, and all the rest of it. Uh, so it's, it's very much at the core of both their cultural identity and their cosmology. Uh, and in this special issue I edited a few years ago, there was an article in there by a researcher called David Lawler, who had, had kind of, was kind of interacting with this, this nature, the nature-based epistemology of this genetic indigenous tribe. And he said, ecologically, during the peyote hunt, they literally go out and hunt the peyote because it's synonymous with the deer and with the maize. It's like this kind of their holy trinity, by the way. And so when they hunt the deer with bow and arrows, they also go into the desert and hunt peyote with, bio, with their arrows as well. So ecologically, during the peyote hunt, the Wicholis, the Waradika, achieve a spiritual relation to their physical environment. Not a neutral setting, not a place to live or exploit for a living. The very landscape is sanctified. The caves, springs, mountains, rivers, cactus groves, and the features of the mythical world are elevated to a cosmic significance. Plants and animals become only labels, conventions, mere human categories of thought. Distinctions between them are illusory. Man is nature. And I'd say this is one of the kind of core tenets of all animist and, and shamanic indigenous cultures that I'm aware of is that, you know, this, this notion of man is nature. You know, we are a part of nature rather than being apart from nature. And that, and feeds into what Jack was bringing up about, uh, about um, uh, nature selfhood, uh, I think it's a terminology we use, which I'll come back to in a bit. So different roles of shamans around the world, you know, they often engage in various roles. They're usually healers in their community, they may be mediators, both within their community and with, between the community of humans and non-humans, so between humans and other non-human persons, but nature. Uh, and maybe within and between non-humans as well, but they mediate between all these different worlds, both intra and uh, inter as well. So if you like. They're often seers, they get visions of the future, they're psychopomps, they lead spirits of the dead through into the afterlife. Tricksters, which is an interesting point in that Jack talked about the notion of uh, the paranormal has this kind of trickster function or element to it. Um, and shamanism often very much engages and plays with this trickster identity. For instance, amongst the Radica, uh, one of their sacred charges that you have, apart from being an elder shaman or uh, the, the, the one who tells the stories, everyone takes on a role for five years, they have this sacred clown, uh, the trickster character, who they call the Chikwaki. Uh, and it's a very important role, a very serious and yet funny role to have for five years. They're often poets, artists, musicians, storytellers, dancers. They consider themselves as the spiritual gatekeepers of their community, but they are also caretakers of nature, human nature and the non-human nature of their environment. And it's no small job being a shaman because they consider themselves to be healers of the world. So it's not just their own individual human uh, biome or environment that are sustaining and looking after in that their immediate ecological niche but you know that the whole 
cosmic planetary kind of well-being, spiritual well-being, um, is, is incorporated into the role of the shaman. So you can have a shamanic experience, that's one thing, but it's a very different thing to be a shaman and have those kind of serious, very serious responsibilities. So you might find shamanism, as I said, partly located between ecology and psychology. Um, and, you know, that might come under the umbrella of transpersonal studies, the study of those experiences that take us beyond our normal everyday ego identity, some kind of deeper connection with um, other. Um, and then within transpersonal studies, you have transpersonal psychology or even transpersonal eco-psychology. And, and the field of research in particular I'm promulgating is a psychedelic transpersonal eco-psychology, which is a bit niche. I, I think I'm probably the only real researcher in this department. Maybe Jack as well. I think Jack, Jack kind of contributes a bit to this as well. So it's, we're a very small field, but you know, ever-growing and also important. Um, uh, and uh, you know, I've tried to establish that with, with some papers recently uh, in the Transpersonal Psychology Review. One of my students, Freya Harold, looking at an evaluation of the role of mystical experiences within transpersonal eco-psychology and also the psychedelic experience within that bigger framework of mystical experiences. Anyway, I started off kind of getting drawn to this particular area about six, 17, 18 years ago when I did a survey on transpersonal experiences that people have. These are Westerners. These are kind of people in the global north and developed world, so forth, uh, having psychedelic experiences. And I, get, I kind of have 17 kind of basic categories of transpersonal like, like you know, experiences, which I thought people may be um, prone to. And you'll notice, for instance, that A, first of all, people don't have these kinds of experiences with non-psychedelic drugs. So there's something very specific to psychedelic plants and drugs, sometimes fungus too, but that the kinds of experiences people have uh, are you know, usually quite exotic. And, and, and occur a lot more under the influence of, of psychedelics. So for instance, 70% in this survey of people have taken ayahuasca, it's a hallucinogenic decoction from the Amazon jungle, had experiences of identifying or communicating with the, the intelligence or the spirit of the plant or plants uh, that they were ingesting. Um, and that kind of 42% with general psychedelic consumption as well. You know that you, you, you eat magic mushrooms then you suddenly have yourself a dialogue with the mushrooms. It's actually a very common experience. Um, not necessarily what it always says on the tin, though, however, it's not perhaps what people expect is going to happen when they take psychedelics, but it's certainly one of the experiences that uh, occur, as do entity encounters and so on. So I started off with this and, and, and came back to this a few years later with more of an ecological um, focus. Um, but, you know, this idea of having encounters with an intelligence of, of, a, of a psychedelic plant or you know, mushroom or whatever it might be, is, is not alien at all to particularly most humanic indigenous worldviews and perspectives, but especially Amerindian uh, uh, kind of umbels and ontologies, right? So Eduardo Viveros de Castro, um, Latin American anthropologist on his work with indigenous shamans from the Amazon said, in mythical times, animals, plants, and humans were all persons able to transform. They were all shamans. You find this idea in old narratives. In the beginning, everyone was a person. The original condition common to humans and animals is not animality, but rather humanity. Humans, sorry, shamans, are able to see non-human beings as they see themselves, as human. Those playing the role of acting interlocutors into specific dialogues. And I actually pinched this phrase uh, in a letter to this research from uh, Luis Eduardo Luna, a Colombian anthropologist who's been working with, especially with uh, the use of ayahuasca amongst numerous indigenous tribes in, in South America for a long time. And he said, in Western science, it's all about being objective, taking away the subject so you have full objectivity, which of course is a complete illusion. You can't ever have objectivity. That's a whole other discussion. Amerindian, Amerindian shamanism seems to be guided by the reverse principle. 
the opposite idea. To know is to personify, to take the point of view of that which is to be known, or rather, who? For shamanic knowledge envisages something which is someone, another subject or agent. The other takes the form of a person. So I think that one of the basic ideas of shamanism is that in order to learn something, you become that you want to learn from. So knowledge is becoming, transforming into, which is something re-emerged in my later survey research, which I'm going to bring attention to now. So I, I did a follow-up survey uh, about 10 years ago now, and it was actually the first, there hadn't been any data out there on, on the extent to which psychedelics genuinely induce this sense of, of deeper connection to nature. Uh, and I was also interested in these kind of transpersonal experiences and their role in more nature orientated approaches. Uh, and so I wanted to know what kind of transpersonal nature encounters um, occurred and with and also with which substances. We start off by asking some basic questions about how psychedelics have changed people's attitudes towards nature. Um, and you know, as perhaps might be expected, though perhaps more so, you know, the vast majority of people felt like they, they interacted more with nature as a result of having taken psychedelics. Uh, and a tiny percent said they interacted a little bit less. So generally people had a, a greater increase of interaction with nature as a result of their psychedelic experiences. People also tended to feel a deeper sense of connection and concern for nature after their psychedelic experiences. In this particular case, and you never see this in psychological research, certainly not my entire career of doing survey research, where you, you present the, your sample with an item to respond to, and 100% of your sample respond in the affirmative. Uh, and that is 100% people in my sample, of 150 psychedelic users who said they're taking psychedelics, they all said they felt more connected to nature as a result of their psychedelic experience. So going back to this idea of correlation, this isn't a correlation. You're asking people, did taking psychedelics change your attitude? And if so, how? And they're saying, yes, taking psychedelics made me feel more connected to nature, which is, at least by self-report, causative. Uh, and of course, two thirds of them felt more concerned as well. Though interestingly, a small number felt less concerned. And when we drilled down into that, usually it's around issues of, um, you know, that nature's kind of going to be all right by itself. And it's probably Earth that's going to shrug off like, uh, like some kind of parasite. Um, I just wanted to know how those those psychedelic experiences and changes in attitudes transformed into changes in behaviour. Oh, actually, before that, I wanted to know what, which was the most likely to induce increased connection and concern, and it turns out it was magic mushrooms, uh, which we later replicated as well. But also changes in behaviour. So the majority of participants felt that they, they changed their diet as a direct result of their psychedelic experiences, 58%. We don't know what exactly, we hasn't drilled down into that, but presumably vegetarian, vegan, 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 raw, organic, local, I don't know, but changes in their diet, probably in a positive dimension, one would hope. Um, and this is the real take home news. I actually managed to get this published in The Observer a couple of weekends ago. Uh, which is, I've been trying to get this in the, in, in the media. What it did, it was flash on the front of the Daily Mail, really, was that dangerous psychedelic substances cause people to turn into rampant gardeners. You know, so just over half of my sample increased the amount of gardening they did as a result of taking psychedelics. And all the way down to the bottom end of the scale was 16% of people had changed their careers to something more ecologically orientated as a result of taking psychedelics. For instance, two people in my sample quit their jobs to take up PhDs in botany, you know, the study of plants, which is a dying subject, as a direct result of their psychedelic experiences. Now, bringing it back to the kind of spiritual and transpersonal realms, uh, I, you know, I think of these transpersonal kind of experiences, the kind of experiences that Jack was alluding to earlier, were also key in these shifts in attitudes and behaviours as well. Um, so I asked people questions about the kinds of encounters and visionary experiences they had, either encounters with mythic beings like fairies, gnomes, elves, elementals, nature spirits, encounters with hybrid, theranthropic forms like half animal, half human hybrids, um, encounters with spirit <laughs> plant or fungus, 
encounters with animal uh, spirits or communication with animals or animal guide encounters. Transformations, a bit like what Rivero de Castro was talking about and was Eduardo Luna, which we see with moment in Amerindian shamanism, of the experience of being transformed directly into another species and then visions of, a, of a, an ecological nature like disasters, earthquakes, fire, deluge, uh, much like Jack reported with uh, alien abduction experiences. I think that work was from Kenneth Grigg. Um, and so this is a really busy slide, but I'll kind of pinpoint some of the main points here. So for instance, ayahuasca, uh, a large portion had encounters with the spiritual intelligence of the plant. 35% had encounters with mythic beings. A quarter had encounters of communications or some kind of encounter experience with animals or guides. And the same amount, 27%, a quarter of the participants said, uh, said they had been transformed into another species. Now you don't, you don't see this on adverts for, you know, ayahuasca retreats in Peru. You know, ayahuasca tourism is, is kind of booming industry now. And, tech CEOs are going out there for creatively problem solving their new app and boosting their KPIs and people are going out there to treat their depression or find themselves. What they probably don't expect to happen is being turned into a jaguar or a serpent or something like that. Which is, you know, actually, a, one in four people have these kinds of experiences, which is quite astonishing. And this is amongst Westerners. This, these aren't Amerindian shamans. These are Westerners who are having these experiences. Uh, and in, interestingly, we, in our own kind of indigenous shamanic uh, psychedelic inebriants LSD, um, we still see these kind of experiences, like about 10% LSD users before having these experiences of transformation into other species. So it's, it's, it's not just the, the, the context of use in, in perhaps in, uh, you know, going off into the jungle, for instance, have these experiences. Um, you know, and of course, in, in the kind of common dialogue and parlance, you know, we don't really have discussions around this kind of stuff in the academy, particularly because, you know, that way madness lies is considered to be like um, pathological if you were to say, oh, yeah, I got turned into a serpent, you know, on the weekend, that kind of thing. It doesn't go down very well with psychiatrists. But as myself and Stan Kripler point out, you know, which is the more mad, communicating with the spirits of nature or sitting back while Earth's ecosystem descends roughly into the greatest wave of mass extinction in 65 million years. And that is a hell of a message. You know, indigenous Amerindian shamanism and so on. You know, the move away from being a part of nature to being part of nature and being ecocentric instead of egocentric. Anyway, we also found in a later survey, more recently, about two or three years ago, we looked at this kind of uh, nature self-identity. Um, I'm not showing you all that, but it's basically a, a, a questionnaire scale. You basically have all these different Venn diagrams of circles uh, of self and nature, and uh, either they're completely separate uh, or various degrees of overlap until they're completely unitary as one circle. And uh, respondents in, in our survey who had psychedelic experiences tended to report a high degree of overlap between self and nature, somewhere between these two Venn diagrams, okay? which was actually much higher than the published norms about the, the measure it had been originally validated with amongst people who had been away on a two week long ecological retreat. They didn't even have this same degree of uh, nature self overlap as did our psychedelic participants. And they found the same thing uh, in a research study in the laboratory, giving people psilocybin. Anyway, we did some qualitative research into this as well. So we asked people, you know, tell us about your experiences in a non leading <clears throat> way. And uh, we found that the transpersonal experience was nearly or always key uh, to the majority of, of these kind of experiences of psychedelic use leading to increased ecological consciousness. But it happened by one of two pathways. And that is two thirds of the group felt that taking psychedelics and having a transpersonal experience boosted or amplified their underlying 
pre-existing connection with nature, if they've grown up in the countryside or made use of parks, if they've grown up in an urban environment, they already had a connection, taking psychedelics boosted that connection. The remaining third, however, didn't really have a sense of this, this nature self connection. And that actually having a psychedelic you know, literally revealed nature to them in a new way. Uh, and they felt you know, more engaged with it. It kind of literally foregrounded nature. For instance, one guy wrote a post about how he came back from his first uh, uh, psilocybin retreat and is, is back at work in the centre of London in his, in his high rise office. And looking out over London, and normally he said before he would just see the city landscape, you know, with all the buildings, and then just peppered with the odd tree here and there. But then he had a complete figure ground reversal after his experience, and he then saw all the trees and all the objects of nature broken by these kind of man made buildings and objects. So he totally flipped what he was foregrounding in his, in his actual perception. Um, so, I'm just going to tell you about a couple of things. So, in terms of the psychedelic research that's been going on recently, we're going to just throw in a bit of neuroscience here. You know, when they first started kind of looking at what's going on in the human brain with psychedelics about 10 years ago, one of the ideas, you know, asked any neuroscientist say what's happening in the human brain and give someone psychedelics and really explosive experiences, they would all say, oh, you know, there's an increase in the brain activity. You can see here from this first brain imaging study, the people on psilocybin, I was one of the participants, that all the increases in brain activity are in red. You may notice there aren't any, which was a big shock. You know, in fact, there's a decrease in activity in key regions of the brain for the default mode network shown in blue. And this is kind of loosely associated with your kind of ego identity and ego control, which once you reduce activity of that, it takes off the constraints of the brain of operating within these kind of narrow, everyday functional parameters. And when they reanalyze the data in a different way by looking at the amount of connection between different regions of the brain, they found this. So the one on the left is the placebo condition, and the one on the right is the psilocybin magic mushroom condition. And so all the circles around the edge represent different parts of the brain, and all the lines in between represent the amount of communication between those parts of the brain. Uh, communication channels. So normally in the placebo, there's just a few bit of communication channels open between kind of clearly defined brain regions. When you take psilocybin, suddenly every part of your brain is communicating with every other part of your brain, even though there's no more activity <coughs> these connected regions of your brain. So you have this kind of neurological hyperconnectivity going on, which gives rise to experiences like synesthesia, we think, which I'm not going to go into now, but also an increase in um, what we call divergent thinking. And that's a tendency to make new associations of old memories and ideas and information in the brain to come up with novel solutions to existing problems. And that's why we think psychedelics are really useful for creative problem solving. Uh, and I was lucky enough to run a clinical drug trial in a a hospital in North London giving top level scientists from Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial um, LSD for the first time. And you know, they all had these kind of breakthrough experiences of like, in this case, they discovered uh, the solution to their PhD research within about half an hour of coming up on LSD and patented this intelligent 3D uh, fabric. That's what that picture represents. Uh, or you know, a guy who's doing his PhD on the Higgs boson, working at CERN uh, at Oxford, um, seeing the gravitational wave, so that they become, so they just ceased to be this kind of abstract mathematical construct and became this kind of, uh, kind of tangible, uh, visionary kind of construct that they were able to interact with. I won't go into all the psychedelics and creativity research, but it, I wanted to throw that in here because I think it has some utility and I don't also have time to talk about the, uh, the research I've been doing, uh, looking at the use of psychedelics in inducing genuine psychic experiences of precognition and telepathy. There's a, a long history of that. It was mostly badly conducted, the research in the 60s and 70s. And so I conducted three or four experiments myself uh, with better methodology, trying to um, 
see if, if psychedelics genuinely can induce these experiences of people of getting access from beyond space and time, much like shamans confess they can do. And of course, had some success in that, for instance, in this experiment, the person that was on DMT had to visualize a future one minute video clip target. And in this case, she said, I saw a 3D hexagon that I can see from the outside and also from the inside. Inside there were cells, organelles and DNA strands. And the actual target of this experiment was a, a one minute video clip about a kind of uh, animating the, the construction and replication of DNA strands. And overall, those experiments have been quite successful. I'm not going to go into that either. Um, but I will kind of round this up so I need some time for a conversation. So in the fusion between ecology and psychology and how psychedelics play a role in that, uh, we can see that they can enhance biophilia, eco-consciousness, nature-relatedness, whatever you want to call it, uh, which has knock-on effects about changing attitudes between humans and their relationship to nature, changing behaviours, making people become rampant gardeners, presumably not just growing magic mushrooms and cannabis, but you know, maybe vegetables and other plants as well. Um, uh, the psychedelics we know from the clinical research can greatly enhance well-being, reduce depression, and so on and so forth. But we also know that uh, spending time in nature also has knock-on effects for well-being. Uh, and so we put forward a paper uh, last year suggesting that Psilocybin, you know, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, clinical research with psychedelics to treat mental health conditions, shouldn't be conducted in labs. It should be done in the wilderness, in nature, because you'll get this synergistic effect of not only boosting people's well being, boosting people's nature relatedness, but that nature relatedness will have longer term knock on benefits for well being, because the more time you spend in nature, the better you feel. Uh, the more your nature relatedness is, the more time you want to spend in nature. And the more likely you are to also then look after your environment because you feel more connected to it and more concerned for it. So you have this kind of massive kind of bootstrapping opportunity of doing psychedelic assisted therapy in nature, helping both well-being and the environment. What I also think is that there's an opportunity here for creative problem solving uh, within ecology and ecological design where we take the same principles of using psychedelics for creative problem solving um, and we give them to ecologists uh, trying to work on you know, ecological solutions. And, uh, we give them to uh, architects or to biologists or to uh, farmers or um, you know, anybody basically has any, any impact on trying to solve ecological issues or, or working on work which has a, an ecological issue we can come up with better ecological orientated solutions to problems, um, not the least of which by having this change in perspectivism, like, you know, as the Rivera de Castro talks about, about this kind of changing places, you know, of giving nature personhood and giving ourselves a sense of connection with nature. So seeing it from that perspective. I'm gonna run this up with a brilliant example actually of this. And there's a really great book which came out last year by Merlin Sheldrake. It came out a year ago. It's still in the, the top 10 bestseller charts. Uh, actually, it was in the, it's still going up, actually. It's called Entangled Life. It's all about fungi. And Merlin was um, actually one of our participants in our LSD clinical drug trial with scientists for creative problem solving. And he talks about it in the, in the book. And we actually didn't know whether or not Merlin was having a breakthrough useful Create problem solving experience because we asked him, I was interviewing everybody afterwards, and they thought, So, Merlin, what happened? He's like, Well, you know, he was trying to find out the nature of the relationship between a plant and a fungus that grows in the Panama jungle. And the plant does not photosynthesize, it's not green, it gets all its energy from the fungus it grows out of. And nobody, nobody really knows whether it's a parasitic relationship or, or otherwise. Um, and he wasn't sure, sure himself either, despite having done three-year PhD project out of, on it at Cambridge University. And, uh, but he had this experience under the influence of LSD. He, he said he was transformed into the fungus. He became the fungus and grew inside the rootstock of the plant, the poirea, and was able to gain some insights into it. And we were like, great, and, and what was it like? And he said, slimy. <laughs> 
And we're like, oh no, he hasn't got any insight. But then the book came out and it, it totally, I'm not gonna ruin the book for you, you have to read the book, it's a great book, but it, it really did give him some different insights on the nature of this relationship. So you could see how this kind of shift in perspectivism to so what shamans basically do of knowing by becoming uh, can have great utility across all domains, you know, in helping us be more ecologically orientated. And I think there's other things we can learn from the shamanic indigenous perspective as well. That is, you know, it, we can have enhanced interspecies communication, uh, that the principles of, of indigenous shamanism are all about harmony with your ecosystem of nature. And they do that through reciprocity, that you never take more than you need and you never take without first giving. Uh, you don't see indigenous shamanic tribes tearing up the planet and, and drilling for coal and all those kinds of things. Right? And of course, reducing speciesism. And I think there's some other things we can learn from the shamanic indigenous worldview perspective, which I think Jeff's going to talk about next in the course, but that is, you know, some of their practices around doctor plants, learning directly from the plants what they're useful for, about manipulating the weather, and so on and so forth. It's going to basically summarize what we can learn. And this is what the inverse of what Jack is saying is that if it was to summarize all, all that we've discovered through the current psychedelic research renaissance is that psychedelics enhance our connectivity on every level, be it the biological, psychological, sociological, ecological, cosmological, or even theological. You know, on a biological level, they increase our interconnectivity between different parts of our brain. On a psychological level, people feel more connected with their own unconscious, their own childhood, their own traumas, their own psychology. They're able to get over the depression, etc. On a sociological level, they make people more pro-social, they have more empathy, they're more willing to have communitarian perspectives. On an ecological level, they change attitudes and behaviours, turn us into grandfather gardeners. And also people feel more connected to the universe at large, the cosmology, and even onto the theological levels of a greater sense of connection with the divine through the mystical experience. So that's about it.